Mark, you, um, you're impossible to introduce. <laughs> Luckily, I think I don't need to introduce you uh, to this group. Um, but you have a resume that goes on and on. I will mention just a couple of highlights. Uh, former Deputy Secretary General, he ran the UN Development Program. You had senior roles at the World Bank. You were a minister in Gordon Brown's government. Uh, you co-founded the International Crisis Group. And maybe closest to our hearts at DevEx, you were a journalist early in your career. I wonder if you could just take us to the moment when your friend George Soros called you uh, or called you into his office, I don't know how it happened, and said, I'd like you to run my foundation. How did this go? What did he say? What did you think? Why did you take this role? Well, I suppose my first answer was really. Um, you know, over many years, I'd been on the board of Open Society Foundations and a great friend of George's. And when I ran the UN Development Program, we were often criticized for being uh, viewed as, as too much in, in, uh, in arms together, sort of fighting for in, the sort of central Eastern Europe region after it got liberated in the 90s, uh, working together deeply in South Africa and other places. So it was a long relationship and, you know, at times we'd speculated between us, maybe one day I should run the foundation, but by the time it came, I was surprised because we had a fabulous head of the foundation, Patrick Gaspard, who many of you would know, and he suddenly wanted to move on into democratic politics. So. I found myself drafted in, but you know, it's strange because if, like me, you've really worked in development for many decades, um, for a long time, democracy was adjacent to it, but not necessarily intimately. Uh, the, the two didn't seem to be two legs to the same chair. Uh, now, of course, we find them connected in all kinds of new ways. And so the mission of Open Society Foundation, human rights and democracy, you know, is in many ways for me, you know, the core defense also of the development agenda I care for. Not so much because you have to be a democracy to develop. We've seen lots of examples of countries that don't necessarily meet that test. But because if the Western donor countries, which have been, you know, the core of the provision of so much both financial and moral support to the development process, have become turned inwards, uh, consumed by the meltdown of their own democratic systems, then you've lost that sort of multilateral bench on which so much uh, international development depends. And so... You know, I'm lucky enough to be doing this job at a moment. I feel it's as indispensable a job as it's ever been. So, Mark, if there is a fight for democracy, is it fair to say we're losing? We're not doing great. Um, you know, Freedom House reports the last 17 years steady declines in democracy, and I compare that to the years I ran UNDP when the number of democracies in the world actually doubled. Uh, so there's no doubt about the trend line. That said, I think it's easy to become quite, you know, overly gloomy because, you know, just latterly, for example, we've seen a rash of elections and more to come in Latin America, which are returning really interesting, progressive, democratic governments to power from Colombia uh, to Chile uh, and elsewhere and potentially in, in Brazil. So, you know, it's not at all a single-size-fits-all problem. And the authoritarian governments we face similarly are a kind of mixed bag of right-wing authoritarians, left-wing authoritarians. But I think if one's looking for a commonality in it all, it is that the social consensus, the acceptance that there were two sides in a democracy, they competed every few years in an election, and both winner and loser accepted the rules and accepted the result, you know, that has been fundamentally breached in a lot of countries. You know, it was dramatically here with the events of January the 6th, but in many other countries as well. And, you know, I think for us, you know, who have been such champions of democracy, we have to step back and be quite self-reflective about why. And, you know, there are lots of theories and the massive and growing academic literature on this and policy literature. But I think what we're seeing in the dozens of countries where we operate, and most recently last weekend in Sri Lanka, is, you know, that it's no longer a matter of one party still 
capturing the support of people because it's viewed as standing up for them and a party of the other side of the spectrum who's kind of sort of thrown its luck behind a sort of populist appeal. That is to diminish the extent to which all political parties in too many countries, or at least principal political parties, are viewed as captured by elites, as simply uh, not representing the concerns and interests of ordinary people. And in that sense, you know, what people have been living through in America, which often can seem a million miles away from the challenges of, say, Zambia or, or, or Nepal or Sri Lanka, you know, suddenly there is a commonality of that challenge. Suddenly Americans are in many ways feeling this sense of democratic dispossession, of, of uh, ruling elites that no longer represent them, uh, that, that you know, has been a common theme of, of, of politics in so many parts of the developing world in the past. So I'd love to know what you're trying to do about that, right? You run now this large foundation, a billion dollar annual budget, you came in, you wanted to make some changes to it. I think one of the known changes is that the OSF uh, approach was to give lots of small grants, and I think now you're, you're considering how do you be more strategic. Yeah. It relates a lot to the conversation we just had with Nidhi yeah. what, what is the new strategy of the Open Society Foundations under your well, leadership? Well, you know, I, I mean, it was a fascinating conversation you've just had, and we're a bridge span client. Um, so, um, and, you know, um, and, and I, I, and a very happy one. Um, I'd say that, you know, in a strange way, when George Soros started the foundation in the mid-80s and was very quickly blessed with a dramatic success in countries like Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and then subsequently in South Africa, you know, it was a sort of trust-based philanthropy. It was a lot of small grants to human rights defenders, to small media outlets, uh, to, you know, black organizations in South Africa. And it was already sort of reaching down way below where the more traditional foundations went. And at the time, because, you know, it fit what you just heard about, you don't have to be a large foundation to do that. George found people he trusted, he supported them. Uh, and, you know, it was dramatically successful. And in a way, we continued that model. We've always done a lot more small grant making than, than other foundations of our size and in a lot more places. Um, but of course, over time, that becomes very labor intensive, actually, seeking out those organizations. And if we were at fault, we weren't doing nearly enough multi-year grant making. But I am now going to risk the wrath of everybody because, you know, we are not pulling away from trust. And as Dimisani said, it's not that it's one or the other, but we are stepping back in a deliberate, purposeful intent to be much more strategic around this issue of democracy. And why? Because we're spending hundreds of millions in this space. And I look at the variety of things we're doing from in a country like the US, you know, supporting critical voter registration, voter organization issues, supporting vital advocacy groups, uh, ACLU, Planned Parenthood, many others. Uh, and, you know, it's a magnificent portfolio, uh, but very hard to evaluate, you know, which bit's working, which bit isn't. And then we look elsewhere in the world where we're doing much more of a kind of institutional take on it. So there are countries where we've been trying to build a credible independent election commission for, for many years. And, you know, often, for example, we did this in Ethiopia and it was swept aside by the events of the civil war and an election which lacked basic legitimacy. And so, you know, and, you know, in many other places, we support civil society groups who are either election observers or advocates for a full or fledged democracy. But, you know, I see it as we've got to be a better learning organization. We've got to look at this total portfolio and recognize that geography to geography, it'll be different. But we owe it as the biggest foundation in this particular space of, of democracy and human rights to be a lot more tough-minded with ourselves about learning what works and what doesn't, because, you know, we're in the fight of our lives. 
Uh, and, you know, you don't save, save democracy on a wing and a prayer. You do it with some decent social science and measurement uh, and a theory of, 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 of change which stands up robustly to the tests you put it under. And so, you know, for me, it's a sort of strategic professionalization of the organization that we've set about. It sounds like you'll be making maybe fewer but bigger bets. And maybe you can give us an example of what those bets might look like. You know, is it institutions like the one you helped to co-found, the International Crisis Group? Is it finding human rights groups or finding groups that work on democracy building and giving these much larger, dare I say, McKenzie Scott-esque yeah. gifts? What, what, what is the, how might that strategy actually unfold? Well, you know, there are a number of, you know, critical global rights and policy-based groups, and you mentioned the crisis group, which is one, the European Council of Foreign Relations is another, Human Rights Watch has traditionally been one, you know, where we do make big long-term bets, but we also recognize that, and, and they're part of a sort of wider piece of this, which is, you know, how do we try to strengthen multilateralism, because the democracy of failure is not just at the national level, it, it flows upwards from that because when you don't have strong leadership amongst the G7, etc., and, and where no consensus prevails amongst states, you have a dysfunctional Security Council and underperforming IMF and World Bank, despite Kristalina's remarkable leadership of the first. And so, you know, we, we, we see the support to the crisis group and others as part of a network of, of, of allies and supporters who are trying to hold the multilateral and international system to account. And we similarly spend a lot here in Washington on different think tanks and policy groups for the same reason. But, you know, beyond that, it is getting down, if you like, in, into the nitty gritty of political process, not in a partisan way. But, you know, I, I would say if this DevEx, you know, is to take away one point on democracy, a DevEx held here in Washington, it's got to be that the world of C4 spending uh, is here to stay. You know, it's more expensive money, it risks, you know, all sorts of scrutiny from those who don't like how you spend it. But, you know, it's just simply the case that our democratic process needs investment in of a kind which in the US situation takes you uh, into C4 and in other countries requires you to take a pay rigorous respect for local law to make sure you stay on the right side of it. But unless you can actually get to the level of helping support party building, of building electoral institutions, of helping support voter registration and turnout, uh, there's a feeling this democracy challenge won't turn around. And I think one final piece is that, you know, I've said that I think there's an issue of elite capture leading to a breakdown of social consensus. You know, I, I think an absolute driver of that and people's frustration is the issue of inequality. Um, and again, in the same way, those years I was running UNDP and the number of democracies was happily coincidentally doubling. It was also years when economic inequality was in a lot of key places falling. You know, I had a big hand in the original Millennium Development Goals, for example. And, you know, and it's no coincidence, I think, that, you know, now there's a lot of debate about how to measure it, but within a, within a lot of key countries, you know, inequality is growing very, very sharply. And I think, you know, that is the driver of, of a lot of this dismay and disappointment and sense of democratic betrayal that is cursing so many democracies or bedeviling them. And, and, and there, you know, we're not a development agency. We can't start pouring World Bank style or USAID style funding into development. But I think we can be a strong policy voice on this. And I've recruited our first chief economist at um, uh, OSF, a Brazilian economist, a young Brazilian economist whose you know, main area of work, Lara Cavallo, is, is inequality. Because you know, unless we get the policy ideas out there and a debate around them, we just let this sort of Gini coefficient go wild. Um, you know, I, I think we're never going to redress this sense of democratic betrayal that 
you know, is at the root of the democracy crisis. Brings us full circle, really, to the conversation with Kristalina Georgieva this morning and her talking about social safety nets, something yeah. you don't often hear the IMF talk about. I wonder, in the same way I, I discussed with her, she's off to the G20. You're in many of these same rooms, the international policy-making elite, let's call it. You're meeting with world leaders, you're talking to finance ministers. We tried to frame DevEx World this year as a contest between a new normal, sort of a series of crises, or a better normal, some way we get past them. How do you think about that, and how do you think about the opportunity to do something different in this moment? Well, look, I think the crises are as fundamental as, and probably I'm one of the older people in the room, so I can say this, any of us have seen, you know, in, in, in our lifetimes, and I think people really need to recognize that. What Kristalina was describing this morning, you know, is 94 countries with this triple crisis of food, fuel, and debt. Um, you know, and with, as she said, 60% of the poorest countries really at some risk of serious debt distress, no doubt in some cases leading to sovereign default. So, you know, it, it, and it happens at a moment that to use trust in the global context rather than, as it was used in the last conversation, trust is broken. You know, uh, the betrayals of the COVID vaccine in inequity, uh, the cumulative sense of a West that looks after itself first uh, and leaves only the scraps from the table for the rest, you know, is now so profoundly built into the politics of a place like the United Nations today that unless we can do a major reset, which is about both a massive upping and bigging up of our economic response to this crisis, but combined with a reset of these international institutions to shift them from their current donor supplicant model to a cooperative model of, you know, a, a real sense of a shared destiny in a world that works for all. Uh, and, and do you think we can do that? I, well, I don't yet... Well, I think what's hampering it is this democratic crisis at home in countries like this, but the UK, my own country as well, because it's just left leaders with no bandwidth and imagination and will to go there. You know, a President Biden, obviously a decent man, but looking over his shoulder at the threat of a Republican resurgence or Trump resurgency, um, you know, utterly just not rising to the occasion of the, what, what the world needs, and his team not rising either. And, you know, you look to the European G7, and Macron deeply weakened by his parliamentary elections, a British system which is, you know, uh, January the 6th in comic theatre form without, uh, with thank goodness, no violence. Um, and, um, you know, you, 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 you just see so much democratic dysfunction that, you know, it, 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 it really challenges people. And I think, therefore, where do we go to find solutions? Really, not least to places like this, Raj, I think, and to foundations and to civil society and to young political leaders in different countries because this isn't actually about just encouraging Biden to be a bit more ambitious uh, on what he'll put up to Congress. This is about the kind of generational change of leadership that I referred to in Latin America, which we will start seeing in Asia. Uh, and which I hope will come the norm again in Africa. You know, it needs new leaders with new kinds of visions for their countries and a new and renewed hand across to the oceans to each other around multilateral collaboration to solve problems they can't solve alone. So, you know, I, I think we're the wrong side for now still of a generational shift in our politics which will deliver that renewal that the system so evidently needs. And I think that issue, that renewal, that democracy, that fight, puts OSF right in the center of the conversation, and it's certainly one we're going to continue to cover at DevX. It's been a real honor to have you close out our closing plenary session today. Please join me in thanking Mark Malik-Brown. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.